you know, a lot of stuff that we've been talking about. But yesterday I went to the car wash and when I got there, the doors, the doors were open. So it's like one of those drive through car washes and I was over vacuuming and my doors were open and this guy wanted to come in to the spot. So I saw that. So I closed my doors and as he came walking out, he like gave me a nod and like acknowledged that I just opened the door or, or just closed the door for him and let him in. So he kind of like pops his trunk. He tells me he's about to go golfing and boom, before you know it, we just start talking everything life. And, you know, as we're getting into talking, he's like, what do you do for work? And I'm like, oh, I do mortgages. And he's like, you know, my friend, Bobby Walsh. I'm like, Bobby Walsh. I'm like, that's the dude that brought me from the bar restaurant industry to what I call the big leagues. Like, dude, that guy was a huge mentor in my life. Well, as we get into chatting, he's friends with Michelle. Bobby's wife and he he ends up like voice messaging her because he said he was going to forget my name so he ended up just like texting her through the voice messenger like right there um but I remember when you and I first started becoming friends I told you that you're the first person in my life that has reminded me of Bobby Walsh and I say that it is and it, it, it's a monster compliment and I say that because Bobby was a giver and he gave and he never wanted anything in return. Now, Bobby's story, just like everybody else's, I'm sure it has his, his highs and lows, but I mean, that guy would give his last dollar to somebody else. Yeah. And like, I thankfully was on the receiving end of all that giving. When he got sick and he had cancer, I didn't have too many loans going on at the time. So he would just send me the contacts and like, I would just originate the whole loan for him and he would break me off a little bit of a piece of it. But it, I, I was able to find my stride through him because he threw me into the wolves, you know? Um, but my biggest takeaway on Bob outside of that giving nature is like the compassion. He always knew, like I would be sitting there wanting to learn mortgages and he'd be on the phone with these clients and in my mind, I'm going, how come he's not talking about interest rate? Why is he talking about closing costs? Why is he talking about this? Why is he talking about that? He's talking about their family. He remembered everybody's kids' names, their favorite teams. Like Goes a long way. all these amazing things. He was about the people yeah. and you're about the people. So th being that Bobby was this person for me that I needed at the time. I mean, I was still drinking back then. My life was a mess. I met him through his son who had autism and he would come in with Sean and me and Sean were real buddy, buddy. And then I became like one of his guys and he, he provided me, you know, the life that I'm living now it has a lot to do with who I've been a person my whole life, but the timing was perfect for me. Like I needed, I needed Bobby. Bobby was there and I would love to one day be able to facilitate success for somebody else the way he has for me. Have you had any people that were say older than you or, or anybody outside of a family member that's made that kind of impact on you? So I certainly have, but before I get into that, let me tell you, you are already unknowingly making that impact on people. Um, Bobby Walsh-esque, you're interacting all the time, pumping people up. You're never bringing them down. I've never once seen you not interact with somebody in a positive light. Now, you might have said things to discipline a kid or a high school kid, wrestling, whatever, um, but the end, it was always for their benefit and trying to get them refocused. So you've brought balance. You're already doing your Bobby Walsh thing. And when you said that to me about being like Bob, or I think me and you were at either the PAL or the PBA dinner, and one of his daughters came up to me and told me the same thing. It's a real compliment to me. And up until recently, I never really saw that in myself. I've always been the same person, um, steadily trying to give back. And to hear that really felt good. Um, you know, but I have been blessed to have some mentors along the way. We've discussed my father's, uh, health conditions and him having a stroke six years ago. When that happened, he was the biggest mentor in my life. Um, he had a guy that was by his side for many, many years, Dominic Russo, who has since passed, he passed to COVID. Um, but when my dad got sick, me and Dom were always super close, but Dom became my guy. And things that I would go to Dominic for, or go to my dad for, I found myself talking to Dominic about. Now this was a guy that conquered many industries. He came from New York. Um, Dominic was in his 80s when he passed. He uh, he grew up in a different time, 
but he was light years ahead of where he was. Very, very smart. He's done everything from build temp agencies, build houses, sell cars. He owned a real estate company in Howell. He was um, a political figure many years ago in town, but he had a wealth of knowledge. And I could talk to him about literally everything. Isn't it great to have an older guy like that who's been through it that you could talk to? I feel like I always resonated with like the older cats. Like I always found myself at the table with the uncles instead of at the table with the cousins. Like I should have been at the kids table, but these guys were hitting me with some real life truth. Like I love that. They could give you that knowledge that you need, not the knowledge you want because he never once gave me the answer I wanted. He Mm -hmm. gave me the answer I needed to hear. So if I was fucking up, it was Bill, you're fucking up. Like you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. Let's sit down, let's come up with a plan. Let's figure it out. When I, I mean, we would be looking at a piece of property. I needed an opinion. He could read plans. He could go through all of it. Like I said, he built houses. If I needed an opinion on a property value or just parenting, whatever it was, he had been there. So he filled that void that my father had left. Mm. But getting that experience, I would rather eat lunch with him than anybody that, not anybody, you know, I mean, obviously I want to sit down and have lunch with my friends. But if I need advice, I'd rather sit down and talk to him at that point in my life. And uh, when he passed, he came in. Um, I'll never forget it. He uh, he walked in. He wasn't feeling great. He had something to do. He had a doctor's appointment. Um, so he left early. I had told him you need to go to the doctor. He called. He made an appointment. He comes back. This was when COVID was not not new still. It was uh the November after COVID had come come around and um, he comes back to work. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I just, the doctor said he thinks I have pneumonia. I said, dumb. I said, pneumonia is basically the same symptoms of COVID. If you're still waiting for a test, they said, you have to get out of here. And he like argued with me. He left and not that we were arguing. He knew I was coming from the right place and I meant well. He left, he wound up in the hospital and he never came home from the hospital. Dang. He was on a ventilator. We couldn't call. We couldn't talk to him. He was in isolation. At that point, you couldn't have visitors. And um, sadly, that was my last personal interaction with him. And uh, that bothers me to this day because I never got to thank him for being there and, and helping shape me in those years that I was searching for a little bit of a mentor. But Yeah, but sometimes when you're talking to those guys that are— way more chapters ahead of you as far as age and wisdom. You don't have to say thank you. Just having a two-way convo, being a sounding board, let him tell you some stories. Let him give you some wisdom. the best story. And that's how it was with Bob. The best story. That's how it was from Bob. And I would vividly like picture these. And there were a few other guys that that happened to be older than me. Uh, Roddy Cunliffe, Zach's dad, my bro. I got a chance to officiate his wedding. I mean- Dude, that was, that meant so much to me. Um, His brother, Tommy, Tommy Cunliffe, Tommy was always my guy, but I love, I I love the message that, that they could relay to us because it doesn't come from a lens of like, a, a lens of like, do this, do that. It comes to like, Hey, Anything that you tell me about, like I've been there or I've been darn close to it. So I can, I'm not going to tell you go do this, but I could say, Hey, I found that if you go kind of this route, you can get to where you want to go instead of going the route that I tried to stubbornly go for so long. And then now full circle. Now I'm the OG when it comes to being a coach. So I'm the guy that they're reaching out to whether they're in high school or youth. Like I was talking to one of the high school kids yesterday and I sent him a long text like while he was in school. And I'm like, Hey dude, you're in high school now. What I've learned in 16, 17 years of coaching is that the ones who stay, who say no to a lot of things are the ones who are more successful. So say no to the vape, say no to the party, saying no to the drinking, saying no to the drugs. It's lonely at the top, but I'm so fortunate that I could be the one I could have never pictured that for myself, dude. When I didn't see yourself a leader, I saw myself as a leader. The coaches would make me captain. Like I was the captain of the lacrosse team, the wrestling team. I was always captain, but I never saw uh, the captain capabilities because I was, I was a leader that was leading by example. I was the guy that would 
go as hard as I could at the end in the sprints. Like the stuff that the coaches saw in me were just natural to me. Like I'm going to go as hard as I so possibly can. you're a natural can. leader. Natural leader without having to be the leader that yells at people. Because I thought in my mind that a leader had to be the one flipping out on people and making people feel terrible or just like, just obnoxious. Like we, we, we saw a lot, we, we saw a lot of old school coaches as we were growing yeah. up. So I didn't really know what a good leader was supposed to look like. Um, but now I have a really clear idea of what these young kids need in a leader. And, uh, I love to be able to be the guy that is like Bobby was to me. Like I could say, Hey dude, I, I have a three month old at home. I have never been a dad before. Like I am bugging out right now. And he's like, just smile and like, enjoy those days. And now I can put myself in these kids shoes. Like, dude, it's hard to be a high school kid these days. Like it's, it's always been difficult, but like we, we were talking about like the cyber bully and all this stuff, like different world, instant gratification, right? just a way different world. And when those guys, when, when, when those older guys were giving us insight, it was hard to see. I remember my uncle telling me before I went to college, he said, be careful with the drinking. He's like, I went to college for a few years and all I did was party and I never end up getting my bachelor's. Dude, that went in one year and out the other. And then I had to pick myself up. I almost failed out, went back to college. And dude, I would have like deja vu of the conversations my uncle was having with me with these kids that were going to college. Like, hey, I gave the same speech that my uncle gave me. I hope it resonates. I try to give as much relatability, but that relatability, the only way that you could really grow as an individual, especially in those college years, is by figuring it out on your own. Yeah. I can tell a kid not to be on academic probation, don't drink alcohol, don't have multiple girlfriends at the same time and try to be <laughs> successful. I can say all these things that I want, but unfortunately, they got to feel it on their own. You got to touch fire to know it's hot sometimes, That's right? True. And that that kind of shapes who you are yep. and who I am and everybody in this room. But it's funny you say the whole leader thing and you think a leader had to yell and, and all that. So now, you know, I coach flag football with Scott. And I mean, I'm talking five and six year olds. We're there to have fun. We are there to win, but we're there to have fun primarily. But the kids love like we do ball moves. We move like and I'm, I'm yelling. So they hear me. They feel that energy. Yeah. But something that I've realized in life for me as a leader, and I'm not saying I'm a good leader. I might be terrible at it. But one thing I've tried to consciously do is not yell. Mm. When it's something important, whether it's with my kid or whether it's with my team at work, I try to almost bring myself to a whisper. I've noticed that me bringing myself to a whisper calms the situation. So now if I'm now whispering, you have to calm yourself so that you can hear and absorb what I'm saying. Dang. And if you're now listening and you've brought yourself down, now the whole conversation changes because yeah. I'm not yelling, you're not amped up, yeah. we're feeding off of each other. So for me, that's been the biggest part of my leadership growth is my tone. I like and that. And if I want you to listen to hear instead of listen to reply, or listen to respond or rebut what I'm saying, I want you to hear it. Right. I, I want to bring you down. I want to bring myself down and bring you down. Do you think, go not ahead. to cut you off. No, no, go ahead. Do you think that what you've learned as a coach over the last few years has helped you at work? 150%. Because I feel like if you're yelling at the kids, you're not going to get anything out of it. You're if not. you're yelling at your employees, you're not going to get any good out of it. So have you been able to take some of these lessons that you've been able to learn for yourself or to give to the kids? And now you show up to work. You had practice last night. Now you show up to work in the morning. Are you whispering to the employees or are you, are you losing your cool? So, or does it take a while to lose a, your cool? Know, it's it's like a fine line, right? Yeah. So, and I, I've learned how to interact with kids a little bit from watching you. Um, you know, kids feed off your energy, right? So if you're negative and you're yelling in a negative way and you're yelling and you're focused on negative stuff, that's going to bring them down. But if I'm yelling, let's go, let's go, and I'm hyping them up, they love it. Right. But if we're going to discuss something serious like a correction, I'm going to kneel down mm. and we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one super calm interaction and the kids respond to that. You're right. So when I realize that, with them, you know, I'm no different than a big kid, just like you. I don't want to be yelled at. I don't need everybody telling me how bad I'm doing and especially telling me 
at a high decibel, which is now making me aggressive mm -hmm. to match their aggression. Let's just bring it down and talk. So like, I'll walk in. The first thing I do when I walk in is like, I'll yell like, let's go, let's, let's get this money, like whatever. And like, I'm trying to amp up the guys or girls in there. And um, you know, once we get to a point where there is an issue and we have to address it, yeah, my first instinct used to be to scream. Uh, it's just what I was always taught. That's how it was done before me. It's probably how it's gonna be done after me. Yeah. I might be dead wrong, but I wanna have a, a nice, cool, collected conversation. Now, if we do get to a point where I've gone from whispering with you or bring, trying to bring that conversation down, and now we're engaged in a full-on yelling match, there's a reason we've gotten there. Because at 38 years old, I've learned to semi control myself. I am generally abrasive and aggressive, but coming from a good place, I want the best out of you, not for me, but for you. So like I have guys that break stuff all the time or make mistakes. Like it's cool. We're going to get through it. Everybody makes a mistake. Everybody fucks up, but it's how you respond to that. So like if you crack the nose on a, on a trailer and you're blaming me for it, now we got a problem. Now we have a problem. <laughs> this is not my fault. Right, right, right. I wasn't in the truck. I didn't secure it. That's on you. If you misdiagnosed the car in the shop, this is not on me. This is on you. But again, we can deal with it. Mm -hmm. But the first thing you have to do is take ownership. So yeah. let's sit here, calmly discuss it. You can take ownership. And now if we're not, we're going to get boisterous. For sure. But those interactions with the youth and seeing you do it has shaped how I deal with grownups in the work environment or outside. I haven't talked to my wife. Like I was going to say, how about with Mary? Have you had fighting. those same hundred percent calming type situations? Like, we, have you learned as you've gone, what yeah. works and what doesn't work? And, so and that's ever changing. Just right. like I'm sure so it is exactly. at home for you. Yeah. You know, one conversation with my wife is not the same as any other one. So like this morning we were talking and we weren't arguing, but we had to order food for my parents, me, my brother. We're going to a, a devil's game. We have a suite that somebody gave us um, from the devils and we had to get food. So now I'm trying to get her focused on ordering food. I'm dealing with a ton of stuff at work mm. and she's like in her phone, like whatever. And like, I need you for five minutes because uh, I only have five minutes right now. And I start whispering and... She's looking at me and we get everything done. And she goes, I don't know why you had to yell at me. I said, Mir, I wasn't yelling. I said, I was completely whispering. I said, I know that. I said, you know, that's how I've been trying to handle things. She goes, yeah, but the look on your face said you were yelling. Mm. So now it's like a lose-lose, right? Mm. But, you know, it's, it's all about like growing. So like if I bring my tone down, maybe now, I mean, I have an angry face to begin with. <laughs> I'm never really smiling. Um... I don't know. Maybe I'm just like stone, but maybe I had to work on smiling more and setting the tone. You know, I've worked on my voice. So maybe now I got to work on my expressions. Like you're super animated. You're all, you are always smiling. You always look happy. Um, maybe I got to embrace that side of me a little bit. Maybe I got to learn how to smile again. I'm like a natural smiler. Like I'm smiling now just that you said that I'm a nervous smiler. I'm a happy smiler. I'm an awkward smiler. Like I remember like forced family photos. I would be like, making this weird face, like trying to smile. I just smile a lot. That's just, but, I do not, but I don't want my smile to get it twisted. Like I am a work in progress. Yeah. I, I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud of how far I've come. I know I have ways to go, but my smile, what I love about me smiling, aside from I'm not confident with like my teeth, especially with the fake tooth and everything in the front, my smile can be calming to somebody else. My smile can be inviting to somebody else where you, if you're not smiling and you got a beard and tattoos and muscles and a bald head, like you look like the dude from, um, uh, sons of anarchy, you know, like who's nobody's walking up to that guy trying to have a combo. But then once you open your mouth, you instantly know that you're a genuinely good person. So if you got a four, if you have to like smile, I don't think, I don't think that would be a terrible thing for you. I see you looking like a tough guy in your family photos. Dude. Yeah, it's not, on, it's, but it's not on purpose. I yeah. don't know how to smile. Like Why? I can smile while, while, while I'm laughing. Yeah. Right. And, uh, I can't turn on a smile. Right, like right. I just can't do it. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, I don't, I don't operate like that. Yeah. And yeah, maybe there's a, a tough facade 
because underneath I'm fighting so much every day, like internally, mm. not, not with anybody, but I think a lot of people are Billy. Like fighting with myself. Right. Yeah. So my struggles are mine and I own them. What's going on here between my ears. That's for me to struggle with. And I could talk to you about it. I could talk to my wife about it. But like you said last week, once we leave, like you're in the I'm car in your me. own thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I, I still got got to battle my my shit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe that's why I'm not smiling. Um, you know, that's why I said, like, this is kind of therapy for me. So, yeah, there might be cameras here, but I'm sitting down. I'm talking to one of my best friends. I'm unburdening myself. I don't I don't need to hear from, you know, therapist, uh, whoever that like, you know, how does that make you feel? Well, I don't know how that makes me feel, but that's what I'm trying to figure out, right? So maybe my internal struggles make me a little stone-faced and stoic, but like you said, once you kind of give me a shot, I think I'm different than your initial assumption of me, right? So I come off as like straightforward, and maybe I do come off as a little intimidating, but... I honestly think I'm like the biggest teddy bear there is. I want nothing more than to protect anybody that's in my circle. I want to hold your hand and get through anything you're going through. I want to go through it with you. That kind of hit me, right? Because one day, like, I'm going to have too much of my shit and I'm going to break, right? And so you I hope to, that someone's going to put their hand on the shoulder and suck and that pain out. That's why I do it. You know, my grandmother who uh, she passed away a few years back. She used to tell me, you know, she was a very religious woman, do good and hope that God smiles on you. And that always kind of stuck with me. I like that. It's like, I might not be happy all the time, or you might not think I'm happy because I'm not smiling, but I'm happy enough that all I want to do is do good Mm -hmm. and hope that one day I'm a little more blessed in the end for it. And... If that means, you know, taking on your shit and taking on Ev's shit and, you know, Tom's, Dalton's, like, I'm, I'm, I'm in. Like, you guys call me anytime. And I feel like that with everybody. One of the things, one of the many factors that got us connected, I've been, you know, out here living life as me. And sometimes I'm like, am, am I weird? Like, am I, am I different? Like, but I meant weird in the sense of like, why am I not like a selfish prick who's just worried about like getting money and. Having a friggin' dope car. Like, that was never on my radar. But I was always the kid and the guy. And if I ever made fun of you and you're watching, I was trying to have others laugh. So that's my bad. But anytime that I was ever kind of dishing it out, I could always kind of take it back. Yeah. But with with you and so many characteristics about you and who you are at the core is really what got us connected. Because when you look around, there's a lot of selfishness in this world. There, there's a lot of takers in this world. Yeah. And when you look around and you get older and we were talking about how you have these friends when you grow up, but then you have some of these friends that come into your life. I think you and I came into each other's lives because we're, we're living similar lives where I, I would give my last dollar away, but uh, coach Lonnie Morris, um, I, I had a wedding a few weeks ago. Uh, one of my good friends, Steve Martell got married. This dude lives in Rhode Island. He was coaching youth football in the morning. He's the head coach of Johnson and Wales, but he coaches his son's football team. He drives from Rhode Island to North Jersey, stays for the wedding itself, and 15 minutes into cocktail hour. He he hung tight at cocktail hour just for 15 minutes because he knew he had like a five-hour ride ahead, so he was going to leave at like 7.30, get home at like, I don't know, 12.30, one in in the morning, coach his kid's team the next morning. But Lonnie... Is, is another giver, another lover. Like that guy ended up in my life for a reason. Nobody was giving me any type of uh, love as far as wrestling opportunities yeah. in high school. Like I quit my junior year, my senior year I did all right, but Lonnie was at Regents. And then we got to really know each other and, and, and become very friendly. I was just talking with him last night. But my point about Lonnie is being a giver. I said to him at the wedding, I said, dude, I can't believe you made the trip. He said, I would never miss one of my guy's days. And I know his, his coaching career at JWU is coming to an end within the next few years. He's been at it. I think he started the program in the 90s. So it's only a matter of time. But I said to him last night, that's a quality that's irreplaceable. 
Anybody could show the X and O's of the sport. Anyone could have that, that, that practice plan. But if you're not connecting and you're not there for them in the good moments and the bad moments, but him by nature, he said, like, dude, I didn't even think about missing this. Yeah. Like, I would never miss one of my guys' weddings. And, like, Nino Gagliano got married. He's a kid that I coach. So I'm now getting to the point where when I first started coaching – these kids are getting married. Now, Nino's wedding was in uh, Tennessee and I didn't go, but we're still connected. I stay connected, but like, I could feel that. I could yeah. feel why he, he feels that way for the kids because that's how I feel. And they feel that back for me. Like Nino invited me to his wedding because I was, you were I there. was there. I was his guy. Yeah. I was his workout partner. I gave him the old school wisdom. Like, hey, I've been here. Try this, try that. I had his back on good days, had his back on bad days. So I have this guy, Lonnie Morris, that's been that for me. And now I'm that guy for other kids. Dude, you can't give me any amount of money to, to replace that. I've been blessed to have a non-rotating staff. So we keep most of our, our people for a long time. And one of the constants there has been Steve, who is such a success story. He's had his struggles in the past. Love that. Um, and we've always been there for him. That was my dad's guy. Mm. So by... By pure happenstance, he became my guy. Steve's younger than me. He's 35, 36 now. But uh, he's become a leader in, uh, in the sober community. Um, he's excellent. hooked up with Danny Regan from CFC. A couple years ago, he just celebrated three years sober. He's one of the leaders That's at huge. CFC. He, um, he comes to me uh, last year and he says, I'm giving a speech at a meeting. I'd, I'd really like you to come. Um, it would mean a lot to me. Now, I was in Matawan. I have three kids at home. I tell my wife, listen, this is important to me. She says, of course, go. Now, she knows how I'm built. And that's why I love my wife. Because she knows that, like, I, I'm i going. If I can make it work, I'm going to try. So I go and I get to sit there and I get to hear him talk about his journey. And where he's at now is so far from where he was. Just being able to attend that. And see the fruits of his labor, not mine. I mean, I might have held his hand along the way and been there to support him. But if I gave you tools, you chose to use them. And you did that, not me. So it made my world to be there to hear him do that or hear him speak about his struggles and where he's at now. And, and now the impact that I've made on him or my father made on him, he's able to make on somebody else and he can pass that torch. Right. So we're shaping the leaders to follow us as well. Like I have a, a guy, Matt, that works for me who is big into the volunteer fire department. He got uh, inducted or initiated as the safety guy and he asked us to come. I load my kids up. We go to the firehouse for his installation and we were just there to support being able to do stuff like that is, that's a leader. For me, that's a leader. How you treat your people that should be looking up to you or looking to you for advice and guidance, that's what makes you a leader and that's what separates people. So you could easily say, you know, I don't ever have to talk to you again. You don't. You have that conversation. You have that interaction. I could easily say, like, Steve, I got three kids now. I don't need to talk to you. I don't want to come support you. Or Matt, who we are I don't court. need to be there. But it's not who I am. I'm always going to put my hand out and pull you up if you need it. Damn right. And if you're already up, I'm happy to stand beside or behind you. I never need to be in front of anybody because yeah. I'm not better than anybody. Yeah. We're all here together, and I exist because of them, and you exist because of your kids yeah. and your guys. Yeah. That's just life, bro. You know, and that's the thing with that's the thing with life. It's like, you know, we can get into our own heads a lot and there's there's different things, but things kind of just happen in life that like it's just so wild. Like I was saying I ran into that guy. Like I was kind of in a in a in a clouded mental space. I was feeling a little bit overwhelmed. It was like in the morning and like the mornings can get a little bit uh, out of hand for a little while. And I was telling you, it takes me a little while to settle down. So after I dropped the kids off at daycare, I went over to the car wash and I met that guy. But I had another moment this week that out of nowhere, it was like I needed someone to hit me up with this text that I received. And it was from a mom whose son is a D1 athlete currently. She randomly hit me up and said, hey, I just saw my son at parents weekend this, this year. Now, meanwhile, this kid has played three sports since he's probably five years old and the kid's probably 20. 
my name comes up in conversation at parents weekend at his college and said, coach Pete is my favorite coach I've ever had. And I'm like, dude, this kid had three sports, 15 years of sports. Like all these people who come into his life. I'm like, golly. And I was, I wrote, wrote back like, thank you so much for just sharing that. Just that little, that little text that, 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 that I have no problem sending to other people. Cause I know how it feels to be on the receiving yeah. end. But if a giver can feel that every now and again, it turbocharges the giver, dude. The giver's the, the giver's phone battery just went from one percent to a hundred from one text message. That they could have had that combo about me, and and a lot of combos will happen behind our backs, good or bad. But it was just a sign. It was another sign this week from the universe, from God, whatever you want to believe in that, that the good that you put out there is going to come back. And even if you're putting good into somebody else, and you could change things or slightly change their lens on how they're looking at situations, they could have that for the rest of their life. Yeah. So you, I'm happy to see you embrace you now, right? For so many years, I watched you not realize what I saw in you. And then whether we were at a, a dinner or we were at a golf outing or whatever it was, everywhere we went, you got more love than I did walking in the room. <laughs> everybody knew you and you didn't realize the impact you were making on these kids' lives and not just the kids, the parents. I mean, obviously I interact a lot in the community and it's known how close we are. Mm -hmm. So everywhere I go, especially like if we do something like the uh, AYF pep rally, we're there, they give my mother, my wife, this football helmet uh, because we paid for the scoreboard or whatever, which is cool. But we're leaving, and somebody comes up and goes, oh, I hear you're really close with Petey Riley, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know how many times I hear, I hear you're really close with Petey Riley? But that's because you're making an impact. And anybody who tries to downplay that or make it like it's not an accomplishment is mistaken. Because, you know, we've discussed this. Life isn't just about making money. Life is about making an impact, right? So... I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. But in the sense that I want to leave everybody in a better place than when I got there. And I could try to do that, but you actually are doing that. And it, it makes me strive to be better. So, like, you know, we could sit here and we could talk about leadership and Coach Pete. You've never coached me. And I'm older than you. <laughs> and you're my coach. <laughs> And I don't know if you genuinely realize that, the impact that you've had on me, my children, my wife, my household in general. So, yeah, I'm 38 years old. I got some years on you, and you never coached me. And you're my fucking coach. You're <laughs> my coach. Uh, dude, I, 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 I really appreciate that, obviously. But I never wanted to be the guy in the room that everybody's saying, like, do you know that guy? And I think that's why people say good things about me because I don't want to come. I'm just a regular guy. I'm a work in progress. It just so happens that people like you have brought some of my better qualities to my radar that now I could say, all right, you know what, Billy, you were right about that. I am a little bit different. I do brighten up people's day. It's, it makes me feel good. Yeah. I'm not changing, you know? Well, you shouldn't. You know, there's going to be people that don't like you. There's going to be people that don't like me. Like you said, there's people that are going to have conversations that are positive, and there's people that are going to have negative conversations. I'm good with it. Either way, I am who I am. And, you know, the person I am today is not going to be the person I am in five years because I'm going to evolve. That's my job as a person is to, to grow and change. If I am the same person in five years, I have failed. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're not the same person you were 10 years ago, just like I'm not. So if you want to judge me on something from five years ago or five months ago or five minutes ago, that's cool if you didn't like it. Whatever I've done, I've genuinely acted in what I thought was the best of interest or best of intent. And I know you have. So, like, there's no point in changing who you are today to appease anybody else. Because realistically... What the fuck do they matter? Because when you go home at night, the only people that matter are you and you being able to sleep 
knowing who you are and that you haven't compromised your values. Your wife, knowing that she's happy and you haven't compromised your marriage for you know a moment of weakness. And your kids, that you were a great father. And that's how I look at things. So I'll sleep pretty good at night unless I'm stressed, which I've been, so. But don't change, bro. You're you. You've made me better. You've made people around me better. You've made my kids better. I see how you, I mean, Scott, me, me and Scott coach football, we're, we're trying to be like you. We watch you every Sunday. Coach our boys, Rocco and Max, started with you. They were little boys. And look at them now. I mean, they're six. A young six, but, I mean, they started with you three and a half, four years old. That's crazy. But look at the focus or the growth that they've shown. And if you can impact a four-year-old like that, that can't focus or can't listen, what can you do for a 38-year-old that can pay attention to your kids? <laughs> it's, it's true. You know, you've picked everybody up and given them a, a little bit of a, a guideline on how to, how to dictate and navigate this shit. It's tough. It's, it's tough to be a giver. But... I'm glad that I am, but it's tough because you could be filling other people's tank and like making others feel better, but still not feel good yourself. That comes down to A, why you're doing it and B, their levels of appreciation. So I can dedicate or you can dedicate as much time and energy into helping X person. If X person has no level of appreciation or thanks for that, and I don't need you to tell me thank you. Yeah. I don't need you to show me thank you, but don't shit on me. Right. Like, don't, if I just helped you, don't take a shit on the floor and rub my nose in it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. just be in the moment. Don't do anything to hurt me. Yeah. Just want, want what I want for you, for me. I want what's best for you, want what's best for me. And a lot of people don't take that opportunity to, to, to live life like that and reciprocate. Right. So you do for a lot of people. And I know like me, I do do for a lot of people. A lot of people don't appreciate it. Do you think that at work, um, you being somebody that not only gives people second chances, um, 17 chances, whatever it may be, or knowing that you're always going to find a solution or knowing that you're going to be a giver and, and help. Do you feel like you get taken advantage of because of those qualities? Absolutely. And how do you kind of, do you just kind of chalk it up to. If you're going to take advantage of me. Yeah. I'm going to be me. Yeah. Right. So I have at any point, I have the opportunity to make a decision. I could help you. I could take you back. I could not help you. I don't have to take you back, whatever it is. But if, if I help you and you shit on me, and it has happened recently um, where I was proven wrong. Everybody told me I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do that. And just the person in me said I have to put my head down at night knowing I did what I could do. If you prove everybody right except me, that's cool. I'm all right with it. But know that my door is closed now. And you're going to need me before I need you nine out of 10 times. And if I do need you, I'll find somebody else to call. Like, you're going to have to reach out to me. And at that point, we're going to have a real hard conversation. And I'm not even saying I won't help you then, but we're going to discuss it. But I'm toxic in that sense that like, all right, cool. I could just stop talking to you today. I'm good because nine out of 10 times, if we're at that point, there's a valid reason for me to shut you off. True. There's a valid reason for me to completely disconnect and disassociate myself from you. And if we've done that, you know you fucked up. And at some point, we're going to have to have that conversation. So, yeah, it hurts. It's wrong. I get taken advantage of. But like I said, if you do take advantage of me and you make me regret it, the only person in the long run that's hurting is you. You know, you could rob me for a dollar today, but you robbed yourself of the opportunity to make 10 in the long run. Truth. You know, you got to play long ball with a guy like me or a guy like you that has a vision down the road of, you know, not building my team, but building our team. And I don't mean a team for work. I mean a team for society, right? So you probably benefit emotionally, mentally from being around us and not hurting or salvaging or, you know, being able to salvage that relationship. Yeah. Now, how about you? Do you, because you're just as much of a giver as anybody, you, I've seen you act. Do you feel that you get taken advantage of because of your kind and genuine nature? Yes, but not intentionally. 
And I've noticed that I need to shift my expectations a little bit in, in others to make sure that I don't feel like I need to change who I am because of the way other people yeah. are acting or reacting or, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it certainly happened specific to the wrestling community Yeah, where like I was given so much of my time and energy to kids and parents. And you think they expected that? They started to. Yeah. They really did start to, um, you know, which is probably a fault of my own because I was almost filling a void through wrestling eight years ago when I stopped drinking. Like I needed these kids and and these these moments in wrestling just as much as yeah. they kind of needed me. And uh, you know, I was da- I was downplaying you know what I was given, but I started getting to the point a little bit where I was just expecting these things to be reciprocal. I wasn't giving with wanting anything in return, but I just thought that like simple asks out of me, I would have thought that they would have kind of stopped everything that they were doing. Cause I'm like, I'll never forget all the things that we've done together. And, you know, I personally did to different individuals, you know, in a positive way. So I just assume that like, Hey, you know, they're only one call away. So if I need, you know, for example, to jump in and run a practice on a Sunday morning because I have football, I thought that was going to be a lot easier. But sometimes young people need you and as they get older, you know, they'll realize and they're they're probably going to start, you know, giving them. But I thought that the seeds that I was planting didn't need much fertilizer. I didn't think there was much that that needed to be talked about. Like what I was saying, Coach Morris told us to pay it forward. I didn't need anyone to water that seed. Like I already knew from what coach Morris did for me time and time again, that I knew that this was my calling. Um, but yeah, I don't think I get intentionally taken advantage of, but I think it, I think it does happen to givers by nature. You say you don't think it's intentional. Um, and I, I get what you're saying because I, I used to feel that way. I don't think people are doing it on purpose. But now I see it as I think they're, I think that it is on purpose, not on purpose because they mean uh, they mean bad, but they don't know any better. Well, they don't know any better, and the situation, whatever it may be, called for you or me to be the solution. Well, and we didn't dictate that. They, we didn't teach them to know better, right? So we came unconditionally, heart in hand, ready to help. Here I am. Let's get through it. And then, like, we got through it, and we're good. I'm never going to mention it again, not that I ever would. But, like, you didn't know better than to only call me when you need me. Right. And what's sad is, if I need you, now let's say I've just helped you, and now I'm in need, and I pick this phone up, I bet a lot of the people I helped, when I call, it's going to voicemail. But I think that's part of of being a giver and a helper and a lover and somebody that wants to fill others' tanks or fill these voids. You kind of see the picture of like the, the male who's like filled with these puzzle pieces and, you know, or, or maybe it's, it's the female that the, the one puzzle piece is empty and he could take a piece yeah. out of himself and put it in there and they could be whole. So I think that you should not change what you are or what you do at the core but keep on your radar that, that that's why I said I shifted my expectations a little bit because I don't want to shift who I am and what I'm doing. But if I don't expect these things to necessarily be a reciprocal two way street, then it's not going to stop me from giving. I get that because generally I see the worst outcome. I yeah, look at do. it. I look at it from a not everything is going to go amazing I know. route. And I'm not saying I'm a pessimist. I think I'm focused in like being a realist and I just have to analyze angles, right? So whatever it is, I look at the situation, what could go right, what could go wrong. And either way, I'm good with it. I'm never going to compromise me or my family. Like I'm not giving anybody life-changing amounts of money that's going to that's gonna make me not be able to pay my bills. I'm not giving away cars. Like I, I'm here to help, right. but I'm not going to hurt me. But I already know that it's realistic for you not to give a shit and for you to take advantage and me never speak to you again. If you had a problem and I help you right now, I mean, I'm on the phone, I'm there in five minutes. Cool. I bet I know I've already analyzed that the possibility for me not to hear from you until there's another problem. Pretty good. Is pretty fucking strong. And you know, that's part of the reason 
A couple weeks ago, I told you, I don't answer text messages. Pick up the phone and call me. You need me, call me. Make it emotional, make it personal, and let's connect. But that's part of it. I think the selfish nature of, of this current world, the way it looks these days, uh, I, I think it's the, the, the selfish nature of them calling you in a situation of need, they are unintentionally naive to the fact that they they were helped by you. Yeah. That, now, it doesn't mean that time won't go by and they won't think back like, oh, dang, Billy's really part of my story. Like, I got to a point, like, I know that there were people that have called you and you have completely changed their life. Specific to the to the drug abuse and, and, and these different avenues that you have connections to to get these people on the right path. Now, it's up to that individual to walk that path on their own and, and like, that's a lot on them. But you're really good at kind of being the QB handoff. Yeah. You know, I'm really excited. Next week, we have Danny Regan coming on from CFC who's been... A huge support in the community. Um, he got a he he got a big audience um, recently. He's he's really established himself in the recovery and substance abuse and mental health community. And I'm excited to bring him on because I knew Danny before he had a really big platform. Right. And he was just he was just Danny doing his thing, trying to help people like maybe we're trying to help people. And now he's kind of he's kind of a guy that I look up to because he's, been, he's able to impact so many people. And he, he's got a lovely staff. All he wants to do is reach out, help, very community oriented. I mean, it's really impressive what he's done. And I'm sure that he's got just as many, if not more stories about assisting and helping people and not being appreciated. Um, in the long run than either of us have together. That's awesome. And I'm really looking forward to next yeah. week. And I'm really looking forward to meeting him and hearing about his, all of the lies that, that he's changed. Wild. Yeah, I'm um, sure. Everything he's been through personally and professionally, the struggles, the ups and downs, like it makes you realize like just just keep being you, because Danny yeah. never changed. Sure. I, I watch Danny build what he's got now from nothing. Mm. I mean, literally nothing. He was just a kid that found sobriety and wanted to help some people. And now he's got like the biggest recovery group around. I mean, they're on Bill Spadia all the time. And Bill Spadia was at my office a couple weeks ago and I was like, yeah, hey, you know, a uh, really good friend of mine, Danny Regan from CFC he goes, I love Danny and Lynn. And like, we had a, a 10 minute exchange about CFC and how great they are. But I mean, this is a kid that came from the bottom, reached up, Picked himself up with a you know a lot of help help from his family and support, and he's living the dream now. I mean, That's he's great. really impacting lives. Like That's we're awesome. trying to, he's doing it every day. That's amazing. Yeah, it's really really special. There's something to be said about those comeback stories. They they give people the willingness to be relatable to people in hard times because I everybody think our, loves a comeback. Yeah, but I think our society gets very judgmental towards people's actions, like specific to people that are on drugs. Like it's easy for everybody else to say, like, get off them. And it's like, all right, well, what are you doing to help this person yeah. get off them? Like, so to have somebody that's been through it, found the other side, like those people are always so, so intriguing to me because their willingness and eagerness to help others because they know how, how it yeah. feels. I, I think we kind of fall into some of those realms that we're able to relate to a lot of different people and we want to help them because we know what they're going through. Yeah. So, you know, whether I know what you're going through or I don't, I'm willing to listen to your story and more than money, more than energy time for me is the most valuable thing I have. So if I'm willing to sit down and listen to your story and try and guide you here or there, or you know, I love that opportunity. I thrive on it. Like I've told you, I think I could fix everybody except myself. <laughs> I'm fucking broken. But we just got to make sure that that we need to make sure that we are helping ourselves. It has to be sustainable. This helps me. Coming here once a week to Wave Studios and sitting down and talking to you with no rehearsal, no game plan, no nothing. Just sitting down and talking to my fucking boy, real life, raw conversation, helps. Yeah. It's all I need to, to maybe not fix myself, but make it so I could deal with me, if that makes any sense. It, it, it does make sense. Deal with me. We could be our number one cheerleader. We could be our, our number one critic. 
But either way, I feel like one of the biggest battles that everybody's going through is just their, their thoughts yeah. and, uh, their thoughts and their actions. And, uh, one of my biggest fears, and we'll kind of end on this note, but one of my biggest fears is that like when I'm older, I forgot who it was. Um, but one of these guys are basically saying like when you're older and you do, all you have is like these memories, like you don't want there to be any unfinished business yeah. or, or I should have done this. I should have done that. And I think that the path that I'm currently on, God willing, I make it to an older age. I think I'm going to be feeling just fine about uh, some of the things that maybe I was stressing about and I got my own way. I think when I'm older and I could kind of replay my life back, I'm going to be really satisfied as to what I brought to this earth. And you to my should. Family. That is a good place to end it. Right? Yeah. No, that was a perfect ending, Pete, because I can't empathize with that enough. Like, <clears throat> the scariest place for me is at night when I'm laying on the bed and everybody's asleep and I, just, my wheels are turning. Mm -hmm. So, like, I hope I look back and you feel will. that way. And I hope everybody outside does, too. You absolutely will. All right. So, we're good. On to next week. First guest. Yeah, my man. <laughs> <laughs>